Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes? No? Maybe? Perfect? Great. Um, my name is Martin. I'm this year's president of the Marshall Society. And I would like to welcome all of you to tonight's event with John Llewellyn, entitled Forecasting in Times of Economic Uncertainty. It's my pleasure for me to introduce such a distinguished speaker, who in fact was a member of um, St. John's College and the Cambridge Faculty of Economics as part of his career. Currently, John Llewellyn is partner and co-founder of Llewellyn Consulting, an economic consultancy. Previously, he was global chief economist and senior economic policy advisor at Lehman Brothers. This formos followed almost 20 years um, at the OECD in Paris, where he variously was head of international forecasting and policy analysis, editor of the OECD Economic Outlook, deputy director of social affairs, manpower and education, and finally, chief de cabinet to the secretary general. So quite a bit. Prior to that, he spent nearly 10 years at the Cambridge Faculty of Economics as a fellow of St. John's College, being appointed assistant director of research in 1974. Now please join me in welcoming John Lowell. Thank you, Martin, uh, very much. And um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, on what is for me a very nostalgic return. So thank you for coming and helping share it with me. I'm not at all sure that I'm going to pitch this talk right. Uh, it's a long time since I was an academic, it's a l even longer since I was a student. So we'll do our best, but I won't talk for more than 40 minutes, and then you can ask me the questions that you wish I'd answered, uh, or at least addressed at the beginning. So Martin, that means I should stop talking at? Whatever you like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. When I sat down to prepare for this talk, I found the words just kept flowing off the keyboard. I realized that um, it was a subject that I cared about a very great deal. It was, I realized it was a subject that I'd thought a great deal about. And I stopped after a while and thought, why is that? And I came to the conclusion, well, one is that we live our life um, by forecasts. There are ten points I'm going to make, so you can see as we go through and you can see how I'm doing for time. Almost every decision that you take uh, requires a forecast. I was going to start my talk by saying I've been a forecaster ever since 1970, which is when I came to the Department of Applied Economics here in Cambridge. And then I thought, but that's not true. That's when I became a professional forecaster. I've been forecasting virtually all my life, ever since I was conscious. Because if you take a decision, which you have all done tonight, to leave your money in the bank and not to withdraw it, you've made an implicit forecast that it'll be there in the morning, that inflation won't have eroded it, that nobody will have stolen it. Uh, if you put on a raincoat, you're either making your own forecast or accepting somebody else's that it's worth it. Shortly you'll be taking out a mortgage and you'll be deciding, do I take it out now or do I wait? When you drive home and you go this way rather than that way, whether you decide to transfer some money abroad for your holiday now or should I leave it a month because I think sterling will be stronger. We do it practically all the time. It's one of the slightly annoying things that if you go to any party, any dinner party, any cocktail party, and people say, what do you do? You say, I'm an economist. Ah, they say, what do you think is going to happen to interest rates? The, the desire to know the future is extraordinarily strong. Now, what do you want, therefore, of the forecasts that people make? I think most people would say forecasts to, to have much value need to be replicable. And I'd certainly expect most of you to say that. Uh, you wouldn't, I think, sign up normally for the converse and say, well, a forecast depends on how you feel when you get out of bed in the morning, or a forecast is made emotionally. Uh, 
I've put down the words the Slifer episode. When I was global chief economist at Lehman's, we, our chief economist for the US was a man called Steve Slifer. A very good economist in many ways, although also an infuriating man. And of course his forecast was particularly important because of the weight of the US and the influence of US interest rates, and the US economy and US imports, you name it, on other economists. So the other chief economists for Europe, for Asia and so on, really wanted to hear his forecast before making their own. And I, as global chief economist, wanted to make sure that the forecasts were at least broadly compatible with one another. And one year Steve Slifer had a forecast which really the others didn't like. They recognized it was his right to make his US forecast, but they didn't like it and they told him so. He stuck to his guns and so they made theirs in the light of that, but it meant that they produced forecasts for Asian countries and forecasts for European countries which they didn't like because they were based on a premise which they didn't approve of. And then one day, just before we were going to publish, Steve Slifer just came into the office and said, I'm changing my forecast. And everybody was as mad as hell and said, why did you do that, Steve? And he said, well, I changed my mind as I jogged into work. And that was deeply intellectually unsatisfactory. And it annoyed all of the members of my, of my team. And yet, I don't want to leave you thinking that forecasting is just a scientific process. In fact, I don't think you'll think that by the time I finish talking. And there are some people who come up with a forecast by a process which they can scarcely explain. One of them was my first boss here in Cambridge, Wynne Godley, who worked with Nicky Calder, my co-boss. But Wynne, by a process which I never really understood, and which I think the first person to divine was Hashim Pasarin, now Professor Pasarin from this university, who said, really, if you, if, you, if you speak to Wynne Godley right, you'll find that he's got a model in his head which he computes, but he can't explain that model. He's not capable of writing it down. And in fact, some of Hashim's early modeling work himself started off by divining what it was that was going on inside Wynne's head. So, yes, forecasts do need to be replicable, but just occasionally you get people who produce forecasts by process which can't be replicated, but you just can't write that process off as ridiculous. If we press on, however, and say, all right, forecasts need to be replicable, then that takes you very quickly to models. In my own case, uh, I worked between 1970 and about 1976, I think it was, on one of the very early models of the UK economy that was put together by Wynne Godley, who was then uh, director of the Department of Applied Economics. And I learned I, that was then a new craft. And in 1978, I was having briefly been at the OECD in 1974, at the time of the first oil shock. I was invited to go there permanently to take over the directorate which was responsible for forecasting and which contained within it what was called the econometric unit but was really a model building unit. And we built a model of the economy. So I was very much a modeler, right, from my first professional job. And I say that because what you'll hear as, we, as the story unfolds is criticisms of modeling. But the first thing about models, of course, which is good and desirable, is that the results are replicable. If you put the same assumptions into the model before lunch and then you go out and you have a very good uh, French lunch with lots of wine and you come back and you run the model with the same assumptions, you'll get the same answer. And so you should. Uh, models are very useful because when you get into a professional situation rather than a research situation, models act as a library of all of the things that you've considered important. In other words, if you thought a particular relationship was important, it was reasonably well established, you put it in the model and it will stay there unless you take it out. 
And the first person who used those words to, uh, for me is, is the late Chris Higgins, who was uh, later to become the Secretary of the Australian Treasury and himself was a most accomplished model and a deep believer in them. He said they've got to be replicable, they're useful because they contain a library of everything that you thought important. And they're useful because, of course, they have a database which ensures that you get the right orders of magnitude. And I thought to make that point come alive for you, I would just give you one small story. One weekend I was in playing with the model with the man who built it, a man called Lee Samuelson. And we, did a, we simulated the effect of a depreciation of the Japanese yen. And economic theory would suggest to you that in normal circumstances, which I'll define in a moment, the uh, trade volume uh, of imports should fall relative to baseline, the trade volume of exports should rise relative to baseline. Prices of exports and imports are a bit harder to specify, but over time, the product of the volume and the value on the import side and the volume and the value on the export side should give you uh, a current account which is a reduction in the deficit or an increase in the surplus, as the case may be. And this didn't do that. Uh, and I said, Lee, your, um, your model doesn't obey them. It became his model because I was criticizing it. I said, your model doesn't meet the Marshall Learner conditions. The, the sum of your import price elasticity and your export price elasticities must be less than one. They're not, he said. I put them in myself. They're not. And I said, well, then, but they, they have to be wrong because the model isn't showing an improvement in the bounce of payments. Ah, he said, that's because of the database. That's the stub. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, the level of imports by value and the level of exports by value is so different in Japan's case that even though the Marshall Learner conditions hold, the balance of payments don't improve. And that was a lesson for me, that, the, that data matter sometimes quite fundamentally. And then, of course, another case for models is that they're, because they're computerized, they can, they can be calculated way faster than human calculation ever can do. You can do iterations fast, you can do uh, all sorts of variants and so on. So the case for them uh, is very strong. There'll be some of you in the audience already who are saying, ah, oh, I don't believe models. models. Models are rubbish. But I think that part of the case is pretty unassailable because what a model does is to make explicit the relationships that you've put in, applies them to databases of the right order of magnitude, and, and produces answers which are correct in their own terms, but only, of course, in their own terms. So let's press on. So you've got a model. They are never complete. Never, ever. At OECD, we had a forecasting round every six months, which used to result in a set of forecasts which would be shared with member governments and then would find their way out, ultimately out into the public as the OECD economic outlook. And each forecasting round, I did 16 of them. Actually, I did more than that because we then started doing them quarterly as well, but I did 16 mammoth ones. And after the first three or four, I used to say to Lee Samson, Lee, I'm really looking forward to this forecasting round because we've now got the model where it should be. And Lee Samuelson, who'd been a model builder even longer than I had, say, let's wait, John, and see if we still think that three weeks into the forecasting round. And do you know, we never did. Every time, no more than three or four weeks into the forecasting round, we think, gosh, this, that we're missing some relationships that we need, or we're missing a small block that we need. And we had, because the forecasting round is an inexorable process, we had to fudge it in some way by putting in other relationships and so on. So it's never, ever complete. That's the first thing. It's therefore, as I've said there, extremely important to be able to modify it quickly. You have to be able either to superimpose on it judgment that you've decided for whatever reason has become important. And that doesn't make it non-replicable. In fact, because you do it in a model, it's replicable. If you put in ad factors into a model, 
then it will always have them until you take them out. Perhaps the best example I've got is of the international linkage model, which I'll talk about more in a minute, but basically it was a model of OECD economies and then blocks of the rest of the world. And it was constructed in order to be able to channel the relationships between one country and another. More on that in a minute. But when I went there in 1974, which was just as the first massive oil shock occurred, that quadrupling that occurred between December and January of 74, oil just wasn't in the model. And the rest of the world countries were utterly passive recipients. They were modeled as simply exports equals imports. And suddenly you were faced with a situation which you hadn't seen coming, in which 2% of OECD GDP had been transferred to a group of people you'd hardly even thought about, called OPEC. And your model was more or less completely useless, because even if the internal part of the then 24 OECD countries was, fo was performing just fine, you were missing out the major story. And over a weekend, we put in a rudimentary block we created a block which we called OPEC, and we transferred 2% of OECD GDP to it, and then we started to face the question, okay, how much are they going to import back from us, and how fast? And we had to put in a price block from that. We said, here's this oil gone up. What's that going to do to our price level? And for that, we had to put in oil imports for each country. So even just getting the simplest GDP consequences and the simplest price inflation consequences uh, was a hefty job. And Lee Samuelson and I worked practically 48 hours nonstop just to get something into the model. Now I'm going to say a few things about where to be careful. I used to say to my people, whether it was in the OECD, whether later it was at Lehman Brothers, never ever let me hear you say the model tells us, or the model proves. Models can do no such thing. The model does what you put into it. It does your arithmetic for you, it does it with the database you put in, but it doesn't tell you anything, and it certainly doesn't prove anything. Except, sometimes, it is trying to tell you something. And hence my next story. We had this model, Interlink, which we'd refined from that early stage that I've just described to you. And we'd used it on many an occasion to simulate the effects of oil price rises. Now, as most of you know, when the oil price rises a lot, it tends to reduce aggregate demand in the world economy for a while. Now, why? Well, we had that pretty well sussed out. You transfer a lot of money all at once from oil consumers to oil producers. At a first degree of approximation from OECD countries to OPEC. That's an immediate reduction in the income of oil consumers of 2%. That's massive. And people have to adjust to that reduction in their income pretty quickly. They can reduce their saving rate for a little while, but it's a sufficiently big shock that they have to adjust pretty quickly. Whereas the OPEC oil producers, who've had their income soar, of course, not by 2%, but by 2% of OECD GDP, so it's a huge percentage of theirs, they can take their own sweet time about adjusting. Even if they would like to spend that money quickly, they can't because the sheer logistics prevent that. So we were used in our simulations to seeing an oil price rise, reduced aggregate demand for a while. It would come back to baseline, but the first impact was to reduce it. And then suddenly in 1982, we had oil prices collapse. And uh, they fell to $10 a barrel. And we were asked, as a matter of extreme urgency by member governments, please simulate the likely effects of this on our economy. 
So this was another of those all weekend working things. We did 10 simulations and in six of them, because we used to do them under standard assumptions, in six of them, aggregate demand, world aggregate demand fell. And I have to confess, we were puzzled. It's not what we were expecting. We got the results out, reported them through the course of the next week, very hastily wrote them up, didn't write them up at all well, I'll, I'll admit that. But the British delegate, Sir Geoffrey Littler, absolutely dumped on us. Uh, he had all the fluency of a Treasury Mandarin who was totally secure in his own skin, and he told us that this was rubbish. This was a case of garbage in, garbage out, and I still remember that little man standing there and saying, we all know that a rise in oil prices reduces aggregate demand, so it stands to reason. Now, that's, you should reach for your gun when you hear somebody say that, but he said it stands to reason that an oil price fall will increase aggregate demand at the world level. And I remember going away from that meeting, licking my wounds and talking to his chief of staff, and he said, well, John, it wasn't a very well-written paper, but he said, I did have a go at Jeffrey afterwards because he was bloody rude to you. And it, I did say to him, he said, that perhaps the model was trying to tell us something. And, you know, when we went back and we had another fortnight to look at it, we realized the model was telling us something. And the clue is in what I just said to you, which is whenever you move a large amount of oil from a consumer to a producer, the cons consumer adjusts quicker than the producer. But we realized that the model was actually telling us something more so sophisticated than that. And that is whenever you move a large amount of money, in either direction, from any one group to any other group, the loser has to adjust quicker than the gainer. So in this case, the model was trying to say something. In other words, the model had simple, sensible expenditure functions in it, which were doing their duty, and we'd been a bit stupid in not realizing what they, what they were doing. Which led me to a comment that I'm always pleased to report to repeat because I think it makes sense, which is a model's results may not be intuitable ex ante, but they do have to be intuitable ex post. That's the test I've always em employed for the usefulness of a model. In other words, I may not know intuitively what it's going to say before I run it, but I ought to be able to intuitively understand it after a bit of thought afterwards. Because if I can't do that, then it's a black box. And there are many models which contain so many equations that you say, well, I, I, I don't know why it does that, but it does. And that's not, that's not acceptable. So I think you're beginning to see, I hope you're beginning to see, that, that already we're into something which is a bit of an art form. In other words, we've got this model. We know what we put in it. We've required of it to be re replicable. We've done all of those things, but already using it requires quite a bit of human judgment, if you like. Because already I've said, don't say the model proves, don't say the model uh, tells us. And yet sometimes it is trying to tell you something. So beware of that. Now I'm coming to the question of forecasting accuracy. And like all of these things, that's not as clear as it might be. To say a forecast isn't accurate, of course, is logically pretty nonsensical because no forecast is going to be completely accurate, especially if you're forecasting lots of variables. The OECD forecasts 15 or 20 variables per country and it's now got 30 countries, so there's no way that totality of that forecast is going to be right. But even if you just take one forecast and you forecast inflation as going to be 2.1 and it turns out to be 2.0, technically speaking, it's not right. So. It's a logical nonsense just to say forecasts aren't right. So what does one mean by right? I think one quite useful test is judge the forecast by the use to which you're going to put it. And I think the weather forecasters uh, do this. In other words, is it accurate enough for your purpose? And certainly the Met Office here in this country, judges the accuracy of its forecasts by asking people who take decisions on the basis of the forecast, 
whether the decision they took turned out to mat be materially wrong. In other words, they'd been materially misled. So to be more specific, to give you an example, if a farmer decides that this is a day when he can spread um, a weed killer because he's been told that the wind will be under five kilometers an hour and then it turns out to be greater than five kilometers an hour, he wastes his weed killer. And so he would say that forecast was wrong. I had another amusing example once. One of my colleagues at the OECD, Canadian, had an uncle who was a General Motors uh, dealer in Quebec. And my friend Mike was back there in Canada one summer holiday and found to his surprise that his uncle used the OECD forecasts. And he said to his uncle, how come? And his uncle said, well, we use them because we think they're unbiased and they're easy to understand. So Mike said, well, how do you use them? He said, well, it's like this. He said, if you're an auto dealer, you can be in one of four states. He said, if demand is slightly stronger than you expect, then you can order a few more cars and it's not serious. If demand is weaker than you expect, you get a few cars left over, but you'll sell them off. But when you get completely screwed, is at the extremes. If you think demand's not going to pick up and it turns out to be strong, then when you place your order, your order doesn't get met because the factory's already at capacity. Or if you expect it, or if demand really falls and you didn't see that coming, you're left with autos you can't shift off the forecourt and you pay interest on them all through the winter. So he said, I look at your forecast and I divide them into four. And if it's for a small growth or a small fall, I don't do anything. But if it's for a massive pickup in demand, I order in advance. And if it's for a massive collapse in Canadian demand, I, I order back. So that was a case of a person taking a, a forecast and then using it for his purpose and he judged that it was useful. can work the other way up. And that is terribly important, for example, in economic policy making. I've seen this in the Treasury where I worked for a while. I saw it in the OECD. And when I was at the OECD, I saw it from all of the member countries. And, and this is the point here. An ambassador once said to me, ambassadors are not always the sharpest. And this one certainly was. And your forecasts aren't accurate enough to make policy by. And I didn't think of the riposte. You know how it is. You think of the riposte later when it's too late to speak to him. But the right riposte is that that's a nonsense observation. Because from the policymaker's point of view, forecasts will only be as accurate as, they, as they're capable of being. And therefore, if you devise a policymaking regime which requires forecasts that are more accurate than they're capable of being, then it's a foolish policy-making regime. So it's, again, there's two sides to this coin. Uh, you judge accuracy by the use to which you put them, but you can also judge the use to which you put them as by forecasting accuracy. You might want to quiz me on that afterwards. Some quick words on the UK experience, because this highlighted another issue for me in forecasting. When I joined Wynne Godley's team, we would have a post-mortem, and I'll talk about post-mortems in a minute, but we'd always have a post-mortem every quarter on how we'd done. We'd say, how did we do? And we'd, we'd look at the errors, and we'd try to work out where they came from. And when we'd been doing it for about two years, in other words, we got eight quarters, and when Godley had been chief forecaster for the British Treasury, so actually he had a huge inbuilt knowledge anyway before he came to Cambridge. But we found what he suspected would be the case, which was the biggest single source of error in our UK forecast, was exports. And the reason we were getting them wrong was because we were forecasting conditions in the rest of the world wrong. So we found ourselves in the, on the face of it, somewhat paradoxical situation. But given that we only had limited resources, limited money, limited time, limited number of people, the place to put our resources at the margin into improving the accuracy of the forecast was improving not consumption or investment or government expenditure in the UK, 
but GDP and hence imports in the rest of the world. And funnily enough, years later, when I was talking to the then chief weather forecaster for the UK, he told me exactly the same story from their subject. That once UK weather forecasts were largely done taking just a simple extrapolation of the weather that was measured as coming across and observed by weather ships then, which were stationed in the Atlantic. And when they did post-mortems, they found that the errors that they were making for the UK were not deriving from what was happening to that weather once it had arrived, but from not forecasting correctly what was going to arrive. And in fact, the story of weather forecasting in a nutshell in the UK is that with the advent of computers and therefore modeling, which had to be financed, the then head of weather forecasting in the UK took the rather brave decision to scrap one of these weather ships, which was moored way out in the Atlantic and told people what was coming, to build a computer model of the Northern Hemisphere. And that did improve the accuracy of forecasts measured in the way that I said to you. When they'd done a post-mortem on that for several years, they came to the conclusion that the biggest source of remaining error was weather systems in the Southern Hemisphere, which they weren't modeling. And so they scrapped the other weather ship and then modeled the weather systems of the whole world as a way of improving the accuracy of the UK weather system. So there's a direct analog there. I'd like now to move to quickly to the importance of linkage models. Just as it was absurd when I was a kid to think that weather was national, you don't make that mistake because you see satellite pictures and you're all very well aware that the UK's weather is the product of a global system. But as a kid, I grew up thinking that weather was national and in some sense respected national boundaries. Well, that's absurd. Nothing respects national boundaries much. And certainly economic forecasting, economic shocks don't. It was in recognition of that and the story that I've just told you that the way to improve the UK's forecast at the margin was to forecast the rest of the world. That I was so excited when in 1978 I was contacted by the OECD and said, would you like to come and take charge of international economic forecasting and international economic policy analysis and by the way you would have in your division the econometric unit. Because I thought, yes! Because we can now do what I've always wanted to do, which was to build a model which is country models, but which are linked. And what we did, and this was Lee Samuelson's genius, certainly not mine, was really very clever, because that's really what the OECD about, was about. You know, countries like the UK had big, good national models, the US had big national models, so did the Germans, so did the French, so did the Canadians, so did the Australians. So you weren't going to add any value by producing another national model. So what we did instead was to create very simple national models which had exactly the same structure for every OECD country, and then we would tune their parameters. We didn't estimate it, and we'd tune them so that in response to standard shocks, a fiscal shock, an oil shock, an exchange rate shock, a wage shock, they would exhibit broadly the properties of the, preferred, the government's preferred national model. So we could say, we've got here a little model. It's, it's a baby thing compared with what you've got. But shock it with one of the standard shocks, and it does pretty much what yours does. Now you could say that to the Americans, you could say it to the Brits, you could say it to the French, you could say it to the Germans. And then you could say, but what we can give you in addition, what we can tell you, which you can't tell from your model, is how it performs when they're all linked together. And obviously, in principle, those differences can be substantial. For example, in a model in which the national multiplier is perhaps, shall we say, one and a half, and it's no bigger than that because of the big leakages into imports, put all the models together, 
and you have a global model which can very easily be three because there's no leakage into imports at the, national, at, at the international global level. So a global model can have properties which is quite different, which are quite different from your normal standard single standalone model. And we had an awful lot of fun with that and we did an awful lot uh, to show people things, which, to show member governments what they didn't know, because you see, they were supposed to be making policy cooperatively, but their mental models were nearly always single country standalone models, because that's what they worked with explicitly or implicitly every day. So let me give you an example. We would have a forecasting round in which we'd get each of the members of the uh, different countries or two people would come from every country and they'd give us a forecast. they give us a forecast for GDP and then for its components and for exports and for imports and we would take those and we'd put them in the model and, and you know what we would always find is what the experts call export optimism. If you added up countries' exports they were greater often by 20% at the aggregate level than country, the sum of countries' imports and that can't be. Because world exports have to equal world imports. So we would put that into the model as a negative shock. We'd, I would say with a certain amount of theatre, I'm terribly sorry ladies and gentlemen, but the sum of your exports and your forecasts is 20% greater than the sum of your imports. And so we've put that into the model as a negative shock equal to 20% of world exports. And that has brought down your GDP forecasts by so much, once you've iterated through it. And it was fascinating then listening to the members saying, and they'd say, well, of course, intellectually, you're quite right, but, but we believe our forecast. And you'd sit there and you'd go around and the 24 countries would all tell you that and you'd say, well, you all believe your forecasts, but intellectually you believe they've got to add up and they don't. And so we're trying to tell you something. Linkage models are also extremely good um, for policy simulations. Because, of course, if you put one country under policy pressure to do something, perhaps increase demand or decrease demand, um, a lot of the effect goes abroad. We saw this in the UK when the government brought in that car scrappage scheme. It did exactly what it was supposed to do in terms of stimulating demand for automobiles. But an awful lot of those cars were produced in France and Germany, not here, because the demand spilled abroad through imports. You capture that to a linkage model, and then, of course, you can say to countries, look, if you want to achieve a given, a given effect, if you do it collectively, it can be very much smaller and it won't, for example, damage your balance of payment. So evaluating policy actions, including uh, internationally coordinated actions, can be extremely good fun. All right. Big models against small. I think you'll probably guess now where I'm going to come out on this. Big models are highly detailed and so they'll answer, I put in answer in inverted commas, but they'll answer a lot of questions. Robert Solo once said to me, the beauty of him, and he was talking about the DRI model of the US, which was an incredibly big model and incredibly detailed. He said, the DRI model will give you an answer to any question. You want to know how much steel demand is going to go up next year, it'll tell you. You want to know how refrigerator demand is going to be in six months' time, it'll tell you. He said, of course, it might be wrong, but it'll generate an answer. And I think that's the point. Big models do generate answers to a wide range of questions, and that can be very useful. For example, the big treasury model has to generate answers to tax revenues across a whole range of different income classes, and you, you can't do it without having that degree of disaggregation. So, so you, you, you can't sneer at big models. On the other hand, they cost a lot to maintain. It takes ages to change them. And I was just going to cite the case here that here in Cambridge, um, Professor Sir Richard Stone's model, which was a model of, of great detail on the consumption side and was put together um, to examine the properties of the linear consumption function, so it was suited its purpose. But in 1971, when the world in effect moved to floating exchange rates, I think it was about six years before they were able to reconfigure that model to work with floating exchange rates. Uh, 
That's the classic problem with a big model. Small models are great in that you can change them very quickly. And I'll give you an example, because I think examples are always more powerful. I, one Sunday night when I was living in Paris working at the AC, I got rung up by um, Rudy Dornbush. And he said, John, have you ever looked at uh, the effects of rational expectations in the interlink model? And I said, oh, God, no, Rudy, I haven't. And he said, why haven't you? And I said, well, interlink's not all that big as models go, but it would be a pretty big thing, and I'd, I'd, I'd need, to, need to really think it made a difference. He said, well, it does. And I said, how do you know? And he said, because I've built a linkage model, and um, depending on what parameters I put into it, it has a big effect. I said, you've built a linkage model, because at that stage we had one of the only two in the world. I said, you've built a linkage model. How the hell did you do that? He said, on a PC. They, PCs had just come in. And I said, gosh, where did you get your parameters from? Because normally, you know, estimating equations takes weeks. He said, oh, Paul told me, Paul Krugman. And then he told me what he'd done. He'd built himself what was in effect a linkage model with just seven OECD countries in it. He hadn't estimated any of the equations, but he got the parameter values from Paul Krugman, who, was, who could tell him to a perfectly satisfactory degree of approximation what they ought to be. Because that's not what he was really interested in. So he just checked that that model, when you shocked it, did sensible things. And then he activated a rational expectations block. And depending on what he put in for rational expectations, changed the properties quite a lot. And that's a classic example of the use of a small model. It would have been quite useless for OECD purposes, because we at least had to forecast and simulate and project at least the major variables for each of the countries, and he couldn't do that. But on the other hand, in a weekend, he examined something which we actually never did get to investigate at all. So big models are better, small models are better. That's a nonsense. It's a question of purpose. Right, two to go. Post-mortems. If you're any sort of scientist, uh, when a thing doesn't work, and as I've always said to you, uh, economic forecasts are never right, but if you're any sort of a scientist, you want to find out after the event, well, why didn't it work? And actually, I conducted, when I was at the OECD, what I believe was the first international post-mortem. I wrote to all of the serious forecasters around the OECD world and asked them if they'd participate. They all said yes. I asked them if they'd give me their forecasts and the outcomes, and they all did. And we set about analyzing them. We weren't trying to run a beauty parade and see who was best. We just wanted to see whether the people who did it one way had more success than the people who did it another. It turned out to be hellishly difficult. And a moment's thought will show you why. Not everybody forecasts at the same time. If they're forecasting 2016 GDP, they don't all do it at the same time. And sometimes just a weak difference. Imagine, just to take this case in point, suppose you were forecasting the second half of 2015. In that week when oil prices went from $100 a barrel to 50 The guy who did it on $100 has got a fundamentally wrong assumption in there. The guy who did it at 50 had probably got a fundamentally right assumption, and the forecasts were only made a week or two apart. But with that caveat, the mean error, and this will horrify you, at least it horrified me, the mean error of year ahead GDP is about a percentage point. So if somebody tells you that GDP next year is going to be 2%, it's just as likely to be 3 or 1. The second thing we got out of the post-mortem was that sometimes, infrequently, the errors are way larger. And the oil shock, the, the, the forecast which the OECD did, and plenty of other forecasters too, after the first oil shock was four times as big GDP turned out to be four percentage points weaker than had, um, than had been said. And what we concluded from this was that you make your biggest errors when you're forecasting when two conditions are met, when there's a shock which is large and novel. And I think one demonstration of that is the 1978-79 oil shock, which was all a shock of the same size, 
shock of 2% of OECD GDP. Uh, the mean error across most forecasters was about one percentage point. The shock was just as large, but it was no longer novel. All right, you've been very patient. Forecasting since the crisis. I hope that what I've said to you up to this point has prepared you for what I'm now going to say, that you'll understand at least where I'm coming from. So just some quick points to finish this off and then it's over to you for questions. The first is that no national model had an appropriately specified financial sector. After the event, it's absolutely clear, at least in broad terms, what you wish you had had in an appropriately specified financial sector. But we didn't. And that's really not as surprising as it sounds, because if you think of the economy, it's got a massive number of agents, a massive number of potential behavioral equations, a massive number of financial instruments. And how would you choose which ones you thought were going to be determining? Not obvious. Second point, even if they had, you wouldn't have had the data to populate that model. Just to flip back in time, the simplest example I can give you was the 1998 Asian financial crisis. Up to that point, virtually every post-war financial crisis in any developing country originated in the public sector, was caused by public sector excess. And people had learned about this, the IMF learned about this, and progressively over time, monitoring of the public sector finances got better and better and better so that you could make sure that it wasn't happening. And then the Asian crisis came along, and that wasn't caused by excess in the public sector. It was caused by a particular set of problems in the private sector. And the data simply weren't there. They weren't collected. And when I talked to the IMF head of Asia, he said to me, you know, when we realized what it was, we, we understood it analytically, but we had no data to give us an order of magnitude. They do now, but they didn't then. I think more generally, the forecasting errors, therefore, that were made through that period, you can't blame the models. After all, the models didn't build themselves. It's the users, the people who built them and then used them. And in some cases, and I'm one of those people, used them in an unthinking way. We didn't say, ah, oh, there's something going on in something we're not modeling, and that may prove determining. And then you add to that the fact that, as I've said there, forecasters tend to cluster. They all cluster quite totally together simply because it's lonely being out there in the cold and almost invariably the answer lies uh, outside the cluster. Three last points. If you think about forecasting and estimating equations econometrically and you say, well, since since the end of the war, we've, we've had 60 or 70 annual observations, and since the 1960s, we've had four observations a year, so we've got two or 300 degrees of freedom. You don't really. You may have two or 300 degrees of freedom for a model which is concerned with the small perturbations which have characterized uh, much of post-war period. But then 2008 comes along with a socking great shock to the economy takes you right outside any experience since the 1930s and for all practical purposes your model contains no information and has no degrees of freedom no informational content and you're forced back to economic history and reading up what happened in the 1930s and that is exactly what the clever people in the British Treasury did, and I admire them enormously for that because they got out the history books and read it damn fast and thought, let's see to what extent that tells us what's going on, and it turned out to tell us rather well. So my closing thought is that applying judgment, particularly as regards what is not in your model, uh, will continue to be vital. That is going to be ultimately uh, 
the most important thing in your forecast. And I can't resist closing with what, uh, given the title that Martin gave me, by saying that something I found myself having to say every forecasting round to the people in OECD. When I got the text from them for what was ultimately going to be in the OECD economic outlook, it, it always would contain forecasting at this stage is more than usually difficult. And as I say there, forecasting is always more than usually difficult. So those are my thoughts. Now let the fun begin and let me take uh, your questions. Don't mind what you ask, anything you like, so long as it's courteous. Thank you so much for those insights. Um, yes, as mentioned, we have time for a few questions and a few answers as well. So if you have a question, please let me know so I can bring you the microphone. I'll keep the answers short so as to take as many questions as you want to want to throw at me. Uh, hi, John. Um, thanks for the talk. It was really insightful. Uh, I just want to ask about building a model. Yes. Uh, just, uh, specifically from an academic perspective. So in my head, I sort of see two ways that we can build a model. We can start from the empirical data and work backwards, or we can start from some sort of micro foundation, build a theory using economic theory, and then test it um, with the empirical data. Um, and in my head, I think it's always best to work with the theory and then use the empirics at the end. But then I'm doing my dissertation right now, and I had an idea of what the results should be. Mm -hmm. I assume academics, when they write papers, have an idea of what they want the answers to be. And as you said in slide, in the fourth point, ex, ex post, the results should be intuitive. So I was just wondering... Ex post intuitable. Yeah, intuitable. So yeah. I was just wondering which direction do you think we should take, should we start from the end point and work backwards or should we start from backwards and go forwards and then use the forward result to test? So should, when constructing a model, should you start with your theory and move back or start with the empirics and move forward? It's a very good question and I do not know the answer to it. I think inevitably the process contains some of each. But I think if you end up with a model which has a theory which isn't bad, and fits the data not too poorly, that's actually quite a tough test. So, I think that's good enough, in all honesty. In my experience, you can often have theories and there's just no support for more than the data, but you don't know our subject being what it is, whether that's because it's a poor theory or the data aren't, aren't, aren't good enough. Um, so I think you work both ways, and I think somebody like Wynne Godley, his mind was always going backwards and it was going forwards. And the test is, can you ex post tell a convincing story? I'm sorry, but I don't think there's an answer to what is a very good question. Who's next? First of all, I'm, I think I'm speaking uh, for everyone by thanking you for being here today. And then my question uh, goes as follows. Um, in what respect do you think that forecasting in economy is a bit self-fulfilling prophecies in the sense that economic actors react to those forecasting a lot, especially in stock markets? We see this a lot. So what's the, in, the actual impact of those forecasting? Is, is it taken into account when making the forecasts? Or? It's a very, also a very good question, if I may say. I don't think that any one forecast, probably these days, um, has, the, has the capacity to be self-fulfilling. When I first went to the OECD, uh, the OECD was a forecaster internationally, and there was really no other other than the IMF, and they weren't then as good as the OECD. They are now, but they weren't then. And then after that, you had national forecasts. And so we did used to worry that what we said about the world might have a, some sort of self-fulfilling consequence in it. I don't think that's true anymore because there are just so many forecasts. And uh, certainly, to be anecdotal about it, when I went to the OECD, uh, a journalist would take you out to a one-star restaurant for a very good lunch if you would leak him one number. Now they, no journalist would even take you to McDonald's, and that's just because there are so many forecasts. However, collectively, I think that's a real issue. And if you look at the world right now, and you, and you 
If you accept, not everybody does, but I do, that the world is suffering at the aggregate level from a deficiency of aggregate demand, and if you look at which item of expenditure is in some sense low relative to what you might hope it would be, it's business fixed investment. It's true of this country, it's certainly true of Europe, it's been true of the US, and it is true of Japan. It's pretty systematic. And we all know that firms are sitting on pretty big cash piles. And we all know that if they decided to spend that money, it would solve a lot of problems at once because it would stimulate demand. That would lead to higher employment, that would lead to higher tax revenues, that would start bringing down government deficits and the whole sectoral balance would look a lot better. But they're not doing it, so uh, why? And I think we've run into an animal spirits phenomenon which we haven't seen since the 1930s, which is that individually firms look ahead and don't see much output growth. And a CEO feels that he, can't, that he or she can't go to his board or her board and say, I think this is the moment to engage in rather vigorous capacity expansion. They'd be laughed at. But collectively, when they all see that, and they all decide to sit on a cash balance, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think in that sense, we've quite likely got trapped now um, in the forecast that everybody's working with. Anybody else? I think we've been reminded in the 2008 event and subsequently that you really do have to have a financial sector in your models and you have to be able to play with it and shock it and amend it and augment it, all the things that I've talked about. And if you had a financial sector in there, even if it wasn't perfect, you'd be able to do those things rather more quickly than if you didn't have one at all. I think that's that's, that's true, and, and I think all of the central banks and all of the treasuries in all of the major countries will now, are now working to put at least a rudimentary financial block into their economies. And I think that is a step forward. On the other hand, if you take that, what I said to you about Lee Samuelson and me saying every forecasting round, I'm really looking forward to this round because now we've got the model in perfect shape, and he'd say, let's wait till we're three weeks in. I think what you can also be sure of is that the next crisis will not be like the last one. Even if it's financial, it'll be, it'll be somewhere different. And there's a reason for that, of course, and that is that all of the regulation that we're getting as a result of this crisis is going to make sure that we don't get that crisis again. Whatever financial crisis we get, it won't be exactly like the last one because the regulators will make sure of that. But at the same time, of course, you'll have clever people in the City of London and elsewhere seeking to make money within the rules as they see it, but they will not do it there, they'll do it somewhere else. And the question is, who will spot it in time? If we were lucky, the regulators would stop it in time and, and, and change behavior. And the modelers would spot it in time and model it and say, look, if this were to explode, it would have these consequences. But um, don't hold your breath. It's much harder to do. Would you say that working at the OECD was in terms of research and results more open-ended than working at Lehman Brothers? In other words, was there any kind of uh, focus on getting a specific kind of forecast that would justify the business model? At, at Lehman Brothers or at? At Lehman Brothers. No. Um, in all honesty, there was very little to choose. I mean, we had slightly different purposes, but not much. At, at OECD, you were wanting to forecast what would happen to GDP, inflation, employment, balance of payments, exports and imports, current account, you know, the standard variables. And um, 
and in particular, as I say, forecasting on inconsistencies across countries, but those variables. At Lehman's, it was pretty much the same. We, we were, f we were economic, macroeconomic forecasters forecasting those things. Um, we'd have a little bit more focus on, on the two basic uh, financial variables, sh sh short rates and 10-year yields. Uh, and we were left alone to, to, do, uh, to do an honest job. We weren't leaned on in any, in any particular way. Um, so no, I didn't, I didn't feel a, a big change in that respect. Of course, the, the people you were talking to were totally different because you were talking to people on a trading floor and you were talking to clients who were by and large large asset managers. And they would take your forecasts, if they believed them, and go on to make all sorts of other deductions which were appropriate to their business. But we didn't do that for them. That was their business. I think we have time for two final questions. You said quite a few times that you rely on the data that we get from other countries and all the, the model results that we get from other countries. Mm -hmm. Then economic uncertainty now is majorly politics. It's the decisions that are made. And we see that in Greece with a, a new party in charge and Spain might have similar soon. So how does a forecaster deal with major politics decisions? With major? Just politics decisions, election results, and just a, a finance minister that changes his plans. Well, I think it, it's important to say what one means by data. I mean, historical data are normally as good as they're going to be. Um, there are countries which cheat with their historical data, and I think we know who one or two of them were historically. Uh, but um, by and large, data are as accurate as the statisticians can get them, and then they stop revising them after a while. So, so that's not a, the only problem there is they're not necessarily as good as you'd like them to be, but, but that's it. But of course, in your forecast, you have to put in things about the future look like fiscal policy stance and monetary policy stance. Now, that's not something I talked about, but it's a good point. The OECD actually doesn't try to forecast what's going to happen. It, what the OECD actually does, and if you think about it, it's rational, because the OECD secretary is serving member countries. And so what we always did was to forecast what we believed would happen on the basis of policies as currently stated. Because, of course, what you're saying to countries is, look, if you, each, if you each carry out the policies which you're on the record of saying you're going to do, then analyzing those using models which, by and large, replicate what you have, but adding the extra thing that they're now into act, we think this is going to be the consequence. And if you don't think you like it, then that's a basis for changing policy, either individually or collectively. So in a way, you quite often hoped at the OECD that your forecast would not come about. Because if it produced an output, an outcome which wasn't attractive, you hoped they'd do something about it. And there were occasions, like the Plaza Accord, where that, that happened. Now, that's quite different from a city forecaster who was trying to try to forecast what will happen. And therefore, a city forecaster might look at, say, an OECD forecaster and say, that country's going to be in trouble if they do what they say they're going to do. My, my bet is they're going to change policy. And I'm going to come out with a different forecaster in the OECD because I believe that. So that's, that's the answer to that question, at least. Who's next? Who's next? Yeah. So I was struck in your talk when you spoke about um, GDP forecasts and how there was a potential error of one percentage point. Um, and then at the end you spoke about how forecasters tend to cluster their forecasts yes. around like some median values. Yes. Um, so to what extent do you think there's a duty for forecasters to report these error margins to allow firms and governments to prepare in terms of robustness for the possibility of errors within the forecasts? I think there's a very high duty, actually, on forecasters to do that. I really do. And I think it's a sign of immaturity in economics that that is not done. Now, after I'd been at Lehman's for some years, we actually started doing that. I had pretty stiff opposition, firstly from a number of the economists in my team, because these error limits are pretty wide. And secondly, of course, you don't know what they are. 
you can say what they've been on average. But we did actually put in a high and a low for the major variables, and, then, and, and I really did have to push it through because the guys would say, but what do you mean by high and what do you mean by low? And I said, well, by high, when I had a definition of it, in other words, not, imp not implausibly high, could, could realistically happen, and likewise for low. Some users enjoyed that. I remember once being invited to Saint-Gobain, the, the, the glass manufacturer in France, and the CEO at dinner asked me to sit next to him, which doesn't happen very often, and I asked him why. And he said, well, he said, I find your forecast very useful in, in taxing my area managers. He said, because they come up with these projections for glass demand, and uh, they want me to authorize the funds to do the investment to meet that demand. And when I say to them, what, what's the risk that output will be weaker than they say, there's no risk, you know. <laughs> and of course they've got an interest in saying that because they wanted the investment. And he said, and if I say to them, well, what if output would be 10% weaker, they'll say, look, you don't know anything about demand in Asia, that's my business. He said, so it's actually useful to me to have a forecast which says, within the judgment of the professional forecast, it could not unreasonably be one percentage point different or not. Now, what we were doing wasn't madly scientifically accurate. But on the other hand, I guess the judgment of a professional forecaster as to what his errors might be is better than, say, the judgment of the head of Saint-Gobain. And anyway, it was useful to him to be able to pin the blame on us. So I, I wish we did it more. Now, of course, Mervyn King, ex-fellow of this college, when he uh, took over, when he was chief economist at the Bank of England, he introduced the famous fan charts, which was designed to show you, and, and people were very rude about those, but it was making a terribly important point, which is that as you go out more than a year or so, the errors explode on you quickly, and he was reminding them of that. So I wish we would at least put historic errors or, or something like that. I, I think the right thing to do would be to remind people of historic errors. And perhaps then to use an algorithm like my little one, which says if the, if the circumstances contain a shock which is large, which I defined as a shock of more than 1% of GDP, a novel in the sense we've not seen it before, remind people that the, that the forecast error could be at least twice that. In that sense, I think our subject is still woefully immature. I actually have one closing question for you myself, which <laughs> I think quite a lot of our members are currently asking themselves. So you have worked at an investment bank, international organization in academic research and currently work at your own economic consultancy. Um, what kind of advice would you give to an economic student looking to apply his skills post-university? <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> I think um, there are certain things you can do. I think one thing, which is quite fundamental probably, is to ask yourself, am I a microeconomist or a macroeconomist? That's, that's, that's quite a watershed. Uh, ask most people that question and they realize that that matters. That's one thing and then go and work somewhere where that sort of economics is practiced. And if you don't know the answer to that question, move quickly between two jobs, one of which is macro and one of which is micro, and you will find out that you are one and not the other. It's just exactly the same as if you're a linguist and you go to the OECD and you say, I want a job as a linguist. They set you a test to find out whether you're an interpreter or a translator. Translators translate on the page, interpreters do it through the ear and come straight out. Nobody is equally good at both. Most people fall very sharply into one or the other. Well, same with macro and micro. So either find out by interrogating yourself or do two jobs in fairly quick succession. Second thing I would say is go somewhere where you're well trained by people you respect. I think that's why a lot of macroeconomists go into the Treasury or into the Bank of England or to the National Institute of Economic and Social Research or whatever. It depends on what you want to do, but go somewhere where you'll be well trained by people you respect because that training that you get in the first five, six, seven, eight, nine years will, will, you'll use it all the way through because what happens to you after that is whether you like it or not, you will get progressively promoted into managing economists rather than doing it yourself. You can try to fight it as hard as you like, but 
you'll get promoted. And you'll want to be promoted because you want the extra money, you want the extra responsibility. But you'll then be supervising the people who do the economics rather than doing it yourself. It doesn't mean you'll be doing none, but you'll be taking progressively higher level decisions. So you jolly well better understand what the people under you are actually doing. And to get their respect, of course, they have to know that you are capable of doing it, even though you don't do it. So there we are. Two answers to your questions. Find out whether you're macro or micro, and then go somewhere where you'll get a good training from people you respect, so that you're then in equ equipped to manage later. Um, John, thank you so much. I think I'm speaking on behalf of everybody when I say that it was a total pleasure to have you here today. Um, and of course, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Thank you very much.